Welcome to our Wednesday Vermont Vegetable and Berry Growers webinar. I'm Becky Madden with UVM Extension, and we're talking today about high tunnel ventilation. And we're fortunate to have Chris Callahan from UVM Ag Engineering with us, and Tom Aiken from NRCS, and Danielle Allen is going to drop in the grower's perspective from Route 5 Farms. So Chris, I'm going to um, let you get going. I'm going to stop sharing and let you start talking about high tunnel ventilation. Thanks so much. Thanks, Becky. You able to hear me all right? Sound great. Great. Hi, everybody. Nice to be with you. I'm Chris Callan with UVM Extension, Agricultural Engineering. I recognize a lot of names in uh, the in the participant list. Great to sort of see you all. Um, Becky had asked me if I might provide a bit of an overview on um, high tunnel and greenhouse ventilation. And my perspective is very much that of the, uh, the engineering perspective, uh, more so than um, the plant physiology, say, or the soils, soil uh, nutrient nu uh, nutrient management or uh, irrigation. But um, I think it might provide a decent foundation for us to have a great conversation about everything that's going on. So let's jump in. If um, some of you may have been at the New England Fruit and Veg Conference, this is going to sound very familiar to you because not much has changed in my world since then uh, on this topic. So it's based on that that talk I gave there. Okay. So from my perspective, one of the, 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 main, the, the main things we're looking to do is control temperature, control humidity, uh, manage soil moisture, and um, uh, you know, uh, soil health, nutrients, lights, et cetera. And for some of you, this might seem like it's reversed, right? We tend to think about soil health and nutrients and, and then uh, soil moisture, and then we think about temperature and humidity. But um, this, is, this, this is really my lens on this and how I, how I tend to think about uh, tunnels. Um, so it might be helpful to just sort of flip the script a little bit and, and talk about it this way, I hope. Um, most of the high tunnel questions I receive relate to either excessive temperatures, um, spring, summer tomatoes, or excessive humidity. And that tends to be more, more in winter and spring green production. So that's what's going to drive a lot of my, my um, talk here. I do want to point out on the lower uh, left-hand corner of the slide, there, there are short links. And so you can follow those. Those are URLs. You put those into your web browser. They'll bring you to a write-up on tunnel ventilation and another one on growth chambers. And the growth chambers is really about seed starting and really just germination. But a lot of similar, a lot of similar content or topics are covered in both of those, really about controlling temperature and humidity. So why? Um, I am gonna do a very poor job of covering um, high tunnel um, uh, disease. Uh, Anne Hazelrig is, is in transit to a, a meeting in Connecticut. I hope to heck others will jump in uh, on this, but these are a lot of the things we're, we're trying to control. Molds and mildews that um, find a way um, either uh, directly into, into the plant or through other uh, damage or injury that the plant may have suffered for perhaps by insect pests. Um, and so, you know, these are the molds, molds and mildews um, that are very commonly um, seen, powdery mildews, um, downy mildew and spinach. And why? Well, one of the reasons those happen is because they have the right temperature and humidity conditions. And when you talk with Ann Hazelrig and send her a sample or send her a picture, that's probably the one of the main things she's gonna mention is um, that, uh, you know, the humidity is probably too too high, um, and that's that's why that's happening. Uh, temperature, you know, for especially for winter greens uh, production, you're not going to do a whole lot about that. You're you are where you are, um, but humidity we, we we can work on. The other thing I'll say is I think we still have very limited visibility into what the, our existing conditions are. And when I say that, I, 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 what I mean is I, I don't know, first of all, that many of us are measuring humidity in, in tunnels or greenhouses. And secondly, that we're measuring it in lots of different places. Um, and I'll get into why, why I think that matters. Um, but I would encourage everybody to consider increased measurement and monitoring both temperature um, and humidity. And remote, remote monitoring, particularly for tunnel and greenhouse con, uh, conditions, has become much more accessible. And what I mean by that is for storage, you know, uh, in a cooler, we're aiming for like 90% humidity or, or above. And that's tricky to do with off the shelf stuff. But for tunnels and, and uh, greenhouses, again, we're looking to be below 
below say 85% humidity. So that's achievable. Uh, we, can, we can monitor for that pretty inexpensively. Um, and there's a, there are some resources for, for um, ways to do that at that short length there. So what I wanted to do or, and what Becky had thought would be helpful is to talk a little bit about ventilation versus circulation because that's that's one of the key things that I, I think we need to we need to differentiate here and then get into some of what that looks like in practice. So the first key point I want to really re reinforce is the difference between circulation and ventilation. Circulation is what HAF or horizontal airflow fans do. That mixes the air in the space. And that's important because we want everything that's in there to see more or less the same conditions. Um, if we don't mix this, mix this space well, um, oftentimes what happens is the corners uh, will have sort of dead spots and you might see increased disease there, for example, because the air is stagnant and has more of an opportunity to uh, condense and, and um, promote molds and mildews. Ventilation, on the other hand, is the actual exchange of air, bringing fresh air into the space and exhausting um, the humidified air or excessively warm air from inside the tunnel or greenhouse to the outside. So HAF fans, as I said, circulate the air. They mix, they stir, they distribute. And so adding more HAF fans is not going to ventilate the tunnel or the greenhouse. It's gonna help mix the conditions inside and get it more equal, but it's not gonna ventilate. So let's talk about what we can do to ventilate. Here's a very, very simplified version of a, of a tunnel. And I invite everybody to use the chat box and let me know what you, what would you, what would you do? What's the first thing you would do? Brand new farmer, brand new farm, limited resources, you've got a tunnel. What can we do to ventilate this tunnel? Use the chat box, or if you are feeling like speaking, you can do that too, I think. So Becky offers open the door, lift up the sides. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, those are the first two things we're gonna do. We're gonna do we use the doors, open up the doors, we're gonna roll up the sides um, to, to, let, to allow for some air exchange, right? So um, a couple different ways to do roll-up sides. Uh, many people use uh, a pipe through a pipe that's, um, uh, that's done manually. So this, the, the pipe that's more or less vertical here can slide up and down through the, the T on the end of a pipe that runs the length of the house and you roll that up like a curtain um, and that holds itself in place just against the ground. Um, there are hand crank uh, approaches the, this can also be, um, there's a motorized version of this, which can be uh, driven with, um, with sensors for temperature, for example. I also saw this not too long ago. This is an example of a roll down side. Um, and what's, uh, so this, this shows it on the bottom right hand side, this shows it completely down. But the nice thing about this is when it starts to open, it's opening up high. And so, you know, particularly if you have relatively um, young plants or if you're doing winter production, having the air come in a little bit higher can be helpful. For one thing, it's away from snow, but it's also the cold air coming in doesn't come in at the same level of the plants and shock them. So there's some mixing of uh, some thermal mixing that happens. Um, this is a really sophisticated but elegant system that was in uh, Missouri that I saw and it's um, got lots of pulleys and it looks like it was designed by somebody who spent a lot of time sailing because it's a lot of like lines and sheets and everything else. So, but all driven by one motor, which is kind of neat, a motor with a pulley. Um, and there are other ways of doing this. Okay, so how does that ventilate? Well, we roll up the sides and we open the doors, rolling up the sides lets there be air exchange to, um, uh, from from the sides on a good site with reasonable crosswind we we can get this to ventilate pretty well um i have come to appreciate the differences in siting of tunnels and greenhouses as i receive inquiries from growers throughout the the region um sometimes what's happening is um they're sort of hemmed in by a hedgerow or forest or or other things that prevent good cross ventilation so it's something to think about the siting 
how else can we improve ventilation in our in in this tunnel? So we've we've got doors and we have roll up sides. Is there anything we can do? Anything else we can do to improve ventilation? Fans, ridge vent. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. So let's let's talk about putting in an opening up high. And by putting an opening in up high, like a gable vent, for example, we can still get some ventilation without putting electricity to it. Um, and what this does is this this leans on the fact that essentially any vertical structure is a chimney. If you have hot air inside something and you give it an opening up high, if that air is hotter than what it is outside, that's going to drive ventilation. Um, so putting a gable vent in up high, good large area gable vents in up high, combined with roll-up sides and, and doors can help really ventilate uh, passively without adding any electricity. Michael mentioned a ridge vent, and so it's doing the same thing with even more area. So the more area you have, the easier it's going to be to passively ventilate the space and the more uh, well distributed it will be. You can see that that ridge vent is open along the entire length of um, John's house here. And uh, in combination again with the, the roll up sides provides for really nice ventilation quietly, passively, um, and uh, no, no fans yet. Okay, so we provide a vent up high and we get that thermal um, stack, which allows for the chimney effect to, to force some ventilation. We can also add fans and louvers to, to, to ventilate even, even more. Um, and this, this is generally where, where we, we land when we have electricity. And increasingly, I'm, I'm finding tunnels, uh, growers are putting tunnels in with, without the intent of having any electricity. So I'm really looking heavily into uh, ways to improve passive ventilation without electricity um, and to do so um, when also trying to include exclusion netting and how those two um, play, play well together and don't. So that's, a, that's something Becky and I are digging into with some others as well. Uh, a couple months ago, I put out a, a question to the listserv about what, what are people doing in for uh, tunnel and greenhouse ventilation. A whole lot of interest in ridge vents. Um, location of the vent inlets, again, how, how putting them up higher, um, for example. A lot of people interested in automating things. Um, so that can be done as, with it, something as simple as a thermostat to turn fans on or to open, open roll up sides. Um, you can do multi-stage um systems as well for one thing to happen when it reaches a certain temperature and then another thing to happen if it gets even higher um, increasing interest in bottom heat so heating the soil um, or heating under a bench in a greenhouse um, either with hydronic hot, you know hot water um, but people also looking at um, using positive pressure ventilation tubes which we'll talk about in a minute to deliver heat um, throughout the, the house a lot of um a lot of concerns raised about the noise of ventilation systems, in particular fans. Um, so in, I think you know that's driving some decision making as well. If I can get away without a fan, I reduce my electricity use, it's quieter. If I can achieve the same result, that, that sounds good. Um, people are adopting uh, higher ground posts. So um, raising the, uh, the, the height of the tunnel even higher, especially the vertical walls. So you get more, um, a couple things happen. You get more of a roll up side height and you also get more height for that to drive that chimney, chimney effect, which provides passive ventilation. Um, people also find, have reported anecdotally that it just feels drier, um, that the moisture that is uh, generated um, inside the tunnel has more space to occupy. And so um, it sort of accommodates that a little better. Um, so uh, we can talk about the rest of this, I think, as we get into the next slides. Um, but there is increasing interest in off-grid, zero electricity and passive options, um, both from a, a cost perspective and, and uh, energy perspective, but also from a resilience perspective. You know, we've had a lot of power outages uh, in my, down my way in the past two days. So having something um, that doesn't depend on that is, is attractive. Vertical airflow is an alternative to horizontal airflow fans. So the hor horizontal airflow fans are the ones that 
you know, uh, if you look at John Bartok's um, greenhouse guide, it's always been referred to as the racetrack setup. You set the, vert the horizontal airflow fans going in one direction down one side and go in the other direction on the other side. Vertical airflow pulls air up vertically and then sends it down the side. Um, and so I tried to draw that as best I could here, but you can see how this fan would draw up and hit this um, curved shroud and send it out to the side. Um, Becky uh, Madden, I think we'll talk about their experiences using one of these. Um, the other thing that's getting, I think, a fair bit of attention is positive pressure ventilation. So <clears throat> instead of uh, pulling air out of the, the tunnel um, with an exhaust fan, some people are finding it helpful to have a this um, this fan pull or blower pulling air in, and uh, sometimes going through a heater um, uh, to heat it up, and then delivering it through this sock that has little holes along the way. And the nice thing about that is it really helps distribute the air directly where you want it. This one on the right is shown up high. Actually, both of these are up high, uh, but some growers have found there's benefit in um, having these down low, especially for early season uh, or winter uh, production. So you can still have some opportunity for row cover uh, over the top. Okay, Be uh, Becky, that's what I had prepared. Was there anything more you wanted to get into at this point? That's great, Chris. Um, maybe we can delve into a couple of the questions that yeah. were thrown up there. Um, First, from Michael, what's the best way to move the air from the corners when we have corner panels, as in that image? I think that was your first interior picture. Oh, yeah. So let's. So, regardless of the image, um, when we have corner panels, so are you talking, Michael, are you talking about additional fixed plastic that overlaps with the roll up sides by corner panels? Yeah, so um, I think that's where really good circulation fans and an adequate number of them come in. Um, the I think generally for a um, the the general rule of thumb is every thirty feet uh, a a typical twelve inch Schaefer HAF fan you should have one every thirty feet. So in a thirty by ninety six, I think I typically see four HAF fans, two on each side, and there probably ought to be three. Um, and it, my concern is I don't think the last one is really reaching that far corner to um, to sweep to sweep it out and help circulate that air so it, it can then be ventilated when needed. So HAF would be the the main main thought there. Um, passively, if you were looking to do it passively, um, there's really probably not a whole lot to do if you want to uh, maintain the fixed um, corner panels there. Uh, you could have a small, um, you could have an exit louver, an outlet louver on that end wall uh, close to the corner panel, which, which may help with that for ventilation. Comparing ridge vent to end wall fans, what are the economic trade-offs? Assuming enough electricity is available to run end wall fans, what's the cost of end wall ventilation compared to the additional cost of ridge vent for some common sized high tunnels to, add, to achieve adequate ventilation in both scenarios? Um, Alex, good question. I don't have de I don't have current details on that in terms of costs, um, but I suspect somebody has done that recently. Maybe even someone in this group could be willing to talk about that. Um, Andy Jones, how much difference does roll up side opening height make? Should I work to get an extra six to 12 inch of roll up or will it not make much difference? Um, I, th I think I would love to hear what other people's experiences are on this with your current setups. But I think if you have any intent of considering um, exclusion netting in the near future, that additional height is definitely going to be beneficial um, just for that purpose alone. In terms of roll up to open roll up to open roll up, um, that's something I'd love to have, see if we could have a little conversation about among this group and see what people's experiences are. I, I, I don't have the measurements. Um, that's part of what Becky and I are hoping to do and 
a project we're we're writing a proposal for right now. Yeah, um, I was going to say this later, but anecdotally on on our farm, we've moved towards those much higher um, ground posts, and it's I don't have any measurements, but I feel like it makes a huge, huge difference that extra roll up height going to a slightly narrower house with that additional height. Our disease issues, the airflow, it just feels drier. There's a nice tall crop. It feels, I mean, and I also think it depends on what kind of crop you're growing, but for tomatoes, um, it feels like a game changer. So how much additional ground post height did you <clears throat> well, we had two um, Ledgewood houses that I want to say, I mean, I, honestly, I think Ed was uncomfortable with how high we asked him to go. I want to say we want at least a foot additional, if not, I mean, you've seen those houses, Chris, they're, I can't reach the top of the roll up. We have a crank and I can't even reach it. And my reach is probably six and a half feet. So um and then the Harnwa houses, we went as high as they would go as well with those ground posts. So feels really like a nice difference, especially for a passively ventilated house. Um, Dan from Rimmel, thanks for piping up in chat. It, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot. It's great to have a manufacturer with us. If you'd be willing to chat a little bit about your information on economic trade-offs, I'd appreciate that. Feel free to unmute. Okay, we'll come back to you. Thank you. And I also wanted to um, point out that we have Tom Aiken here from NRCS um, as a resource for NRCS incentives. I wasn't quite aware of how much NRCS supports high tunnel high tunnels beyond the initial <laughs> installation of them. So um, yeah. if people have questions too as we go along, feel free to um, to lean on Tom a little bit. Yeah, Becky, just briefly, um, <clears throat> we um, have um, a bunch of energy practices that can be added on to high tunnels, existing high tunnels. So the first step is if, an, if a farmer has an energy audit, um, which we can also fund through, through EQIP, and I'll put the links into um, the chat as to how farmers can um, sign up for those energy audits. But we can um, retrofit high tunnels with ridge vents, um, as well as um, horizontal airflow um, fans, and also um, end ventilation units, uh, as well as as um, soil heating units as well. So um, those are all add-on practices. Um, it's um, the name of the practice is um, efficient uh, on-farm energy efficiency. Um, and the only caveat is that it does require uh, an energy audit first. But um, yeah, the, the high tunnel program through uh, NRCS, um, it's funded through EQIP. Um, there's a huge, huge demand. Um, it's very, very competitive. But um, I think if you're if you're uh, patient and willing to work through the government BS, um, it's worth it in the long run. But um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy to try and answer them. Thanks so much, Tom. I, yeah, I think a lot of folks on this call have um, benefited from NRCS high tunnel incentives and appreciate them a lot and the support a lot. So thanks for all that you do. Um, folks can keep popping questions into the chat. And um, I was just gonna share a few slides about um, what's happening on my farm uh, with high tunnels. And I don't have any like um, huge insights, except that I think like many people, we have kind of scattershot trying to figure out ventilation. And um, um, and like Chris mentioned, there's all these different ways to do it. And I think as like, you know, many farmers, as we've progressed, we have tried a lot of systems. As I just mentioned, the I think the winning point for us has been these tall ground posts for passive ventilation. 
this tunnel here, we have a ridge vent. This was a used Arnois house that was um, my partner had put up before I even arrived at the farm. It had a ridge vent, one of the old crank ones. Um, it was oriented poorly, like, so it's facing the wind. It's terrifying to reskin. So as much as we love it for ventilation, it's been really hard to maintain. So um, I think those are a really ideal way for ventilation, but a struggle for us personally here. And um, in this house, we put on a, a head house with these like doors, these sliding doors you can see. And then I think I have a better picture of the vertical airflow fan we have. We've also been um, trying to put in these butterfly vents or these gable end vents. And to be honest, sometimes that means just um, panicking in the middle of the summer and cutting the plastic away and then taping it up really well or framing it out retroactively after the fact. But that makes such a difference in the heat of the summer to get that um, gable end. And this is one of the houses with those extended ground posts. You can see how high they are, especially because we built it up um, quite high off the ground, but really awesome um, game changer for us. And then on this, this is actually our prop house now, but we built, we framed out this, um, this passive vent we also have this um, fan vent, but to run a little less electricity in the summer, we just pop this open, prop it open, and um, don't run the fans. This is that vertical airflow fan. We really like these. Um, they're uh, we learned them because they're used in uh, like chicken, um, like chicken houses, and to really get that air, you know, to prevent disease in birds. And so, like Chris said, it's just moving the air up from the canopy. And I, I've, I mean, I don't have the measurements Chris has, but with the HAF fans, it seems like when you have a really thick canopy of tomatoes, it's might not be moving the air the way we want it to. So this seems to be doing the trick. I think we need probably three per, you know, 30 by 90 tunnel, but really like that. And then these socket roll-ups like Chris was mentioning, um, these have been our compromise between an automated um, advancing alternatives one versus a hand roll up. We have 10 houses now and um, it takes, you know, 20 minutes with the sockets to pop these up. So I, I'd say this has been a nice advancement compromise on our farm. Um, and I think that's it. I was um, gonna just, show a few um, kind of ventilation related or not issues that we see, but kind of ripening issues, disease stress. I, I think this is like part of this bigger conversation about dialing in high tunnel production and how all these things interplay together. So like plant spacing, horticultural practices, nutrient management, like Chris mentioned at the beginning, but how does that play out in terms of yield and crop quality? Well, here we have some uneven ripening diseases, um, fruit cracking, um, <clears throat> some shouldering. Um, this is actually Andy's farm is on the call, but some botrytis, uh, more botrytis. <laughs> it gets kind of gnarly, right? This is what we have to look forward to this year. Powdery mildew. And um, so just to touch on like how important this all is and what can we do in terms of like the engineering to improve our outcomes? So I will stop and uh, look at questions now. Um, and if people want to pipe in with questions too. I can't tell if it's Ben or Danielle, but um, one of them was asking, uh, we have exclusion netting. Summer temps are higher and more humid. Any thoughts on whether two fans in the end wall or one big one? Um, it's a great question. I mean, the when when I think about it, I think of what's going to give you the most year-round or longer season benefit. And so, I would tend to opt for two fans. And what that does is it gives you your sort of baseline ventilation with one fan. Um, and then when you need to bump up ventilation, you have the second fan as a second stage available to you. The the benefit of that is just. Uh, less generally speaking less electricity use um less energy use um because you're not using your maximum ventilation rate all the time 
You can do the same thing with a two-speed fan setup or a variable speed drive. Um, the times I've looked at it, the cost of two fans, two single speed fans is much, much lower than trying to do it with uh, a larger variable speed drive type fan. So um, at least for the flow rates we're talking about here. Hi, John. Hey, Chris, how are you? Good. Thanks for joining hey. us. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm here with Dan. Um, I do have some, I don't have any uh, slides to share, but uh, as far as the numbers go on the um, energy cost on the fans, so fans are usually cheaper than a ridge vent. You know, fans could be, you know, anywhere from two to three thousand dollars, where a ridge vent may be closer to like four to five thousand dollars. Um, an electrical cost, when we did some experiments here, uh, and this is before energy rates went up in the last couple of years, but um, the money or the um, the money it would cost to do a bridge vent was somewhere between twenty five and fifty dollars a year because it just runs for a couple of seconds and then stops um, versus fans and shutters on like a thirty by ninety six uh, tunnel usually is somewhere between five hundred and a thousand dollars a year in electrical costs. So I think it's going to take you probably you know four plus years to pay off with just electrical costs. That's great. Thanks for sharing that information. Ditto. Absolutely. Thank you. And I, I, That's really helpful to hear too. I, I don't know if, um, do you remember Chris last year at the VVBGA uh, annual meeting? I, I can't remember who the, the gentleman from Canada presented and he had that like giant, huge fan. He was just pushing air out of his tunnel all winter long with i don't remember that no he was moving an insane amount of air and he was like well we have subsidized energy costs but it was and it, the results were awesome he's just running it all the time and just like so if it. anybody really wants to feel sad about their utility costs i talked with a grower in labrador recently who gets their electricity for 1.5 cents per kilowatt hour yeah different different drivers for sure Um, I don't know if Ben, if you had any thoughts to share since you're a top notch ventilator. Um, um, you guys have done some beautiful butterfly vents and other things. Did you want to talk for a minute or? Feel yes. free to un unmute whenever you're ready, Ben. Um, I do see another question here about 12 or 24 volt fans that can be used for uh, with solar power. Um, the the fans I've seen um used in those types of systems generally come from the automotive industry so it's a it's a radiator fan um, for 12 volt systems and they they've they've worked very very well um, for for those growers so short answer is yes um, take a look at some automotive fans and tom has, tom has provided a little bit of information on the ridge vent reimbursement rate which is about 50 dollars per linear foot had a private request to see if Mike uh, Feiner, Feiner, Mike, I don't know how to pronounce your last name. I'm sorry, but somebody's wondering if you'd be interested in sharing some of your experiences with Ridge Vent installs. Yeah, can you hear me? I can. So uh, thanks for asking. To um, piggyback on what John Wells said at Rimmel, the Ridge Vent is obviously a more expensive um expenditure up front takes a little bit longer to build and they're also constantly evolving uh there's new ones that are being changed every few years uh we'll be building an arnwa one this spring uh that's a i think it's about a seven foot long um clamshell type um ridge vent so it's a really long one we haven't built one quite this big before um obviously that'll let out a lot of air i think it was uh, the installation takes time. They can be a little bit maddening at, at times. Um, I haven't done an Arnois like this. We have done a few Rimmel Ridge vents. We've done a few other Ridge vents that you can get from a few other places. There's a vertical roll-up Ridge vent we did at Vermont Compost one year. They're having success with, but it takes time to install. Um, also, speaking to what I think uh, Becky had said earlier, um, even if it's oriented in the right direction, 
repolying ridge vents is a bear. Um, takes a lot more time depending on the size. Arnois houses tend to be big houses, um, both width and length. So a 200 foot house is going to, we have a few of those to do with ridge vents. Uh, it's days, it's a days process, especially if we're using double layer poly. Um, the ridge vents tend to all function pretty well on their own when they're working. Automated ridge vents um, are easier to deal with than uh, manual ridge vents. Um, obviously, to what you were saying earlier, it's probably the most efficient way to ventilate your house. Um, rolling up your sides or some low end wall ventilation options um, and then having that convection. It's just that really passive convection. Um, we personally, speaking for myself only, don't love installing ridge vents just because they're a pain. Um, but when they're there um, and when we do install them, folks that have them really love them. When they do, when there is trouble with them, that's more annoying than anything else um, to deal with. So over time, if they need to be repaired and things like that, um, one thing I recommend is if possible, having your ridge vent be a... I think we might've lost you. That sounded like a key recommendation to you. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so that's my piece. Anyone who wanted to talk more about it, I'm happy to discuss. They can reach out to me personally um, or reach out to John. He's a wealth of information on ridge vents as well. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, cheers. And thanks for doing the work that's even a pain. <laughs> that's important. That's my pleasure. Yeah. Um, Becky, you see Ben's note there? Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Um, he says that um, the butterfly vents that he's built are controlled with ropes and cleats on the inside and go up high to stay out of the way of the doors. And um, yeah, I think Ben and Danielle have done some great ventilation additions on their houses and really um, have some stylish cleat tie-offs. Um, I guess one question I had for this group that I'm curious about is winter moisture management in the tunnels, um, how to keep, you know, I, I know like we see a lot of dripping and kind of related diseases in winter tunnels from ventilation and what folks are doing, if they've got any tips and tricks on that front. Especially right now, because we can't roll up sides with like two feet of snow on the <laughs> sides and then the sun comes out and it's like, oh. Hey, Becky. Uh, we have peak vents on both ends of the 30 by 96, and they're open all the time, all winter long. Um, and then the only issue we see more with moisture is if row covers are left on overextended cloudy days, then you start get, getting more moisture built up underneath the row covers. So really, if you're using row covers, it really pays to get the covers off as much as possible to get that moisture uh, off the leaves. Thanks, Tim. That's awesome. So you you're just to clarify, you're leaving your peak vents open all winter long, regardless. Yes. Yeah. Even when it's 20 below, we just instead of closing peak vents, we'll just put extra row covers on uh, just to make sure that we have adequate ventilation all winter long. And that really seems to make a big difference. So my technique of cutting the plastic on the peaks is actually a good one because they never need to get closed. Right. <laughs> Neat. Any other thoughts on, on winter moisture management? I, yeah, I would say I think we've kind of backtracked from worrying so much about winter temperatures in the tunnels and kind of realizing that you only gain like a couple degrees anyway, and that if moisture is the issue, then why not just leave those things open? That's great. Yeah, Becky, I, I would say we haven't been brave enough yet to just like leave everything open all winter, but um, but we did a number of years ago put in a 36 inch peak fan on one end and a louver on the opposite um, just for winter ventilation when the roll-ups are um, snowed in. We have a 32 by 132 foot houses and um, it really makes a big difference compared to when we couldn't do that and we were just opening the doors uh, and getting passive ventilation. Um, you know, if anything, I would love to have it be a a 48 
inch fan um but still 36 is is pretty good when it's cool outside or warm and then we keep it set thermostatically so that it ventilates starting at about 40 or 45 depending on what we have in the house so anytime there's really any sun we're hoping that we can have enough warm air to like pick up some of the moisture that's sitting on the plastic and exhaust it out with that fan it's not perfect but it's it's certainly an improvement over what we what we used to have that's great thanks andy yeah i think like on some of the early days um i was trained to like blast the heat and open the vents on cool days and you know i guess it's not really environmental but that idea of moving that hot air the the moist air out with some sun of movement is really great so any other thoughts i did have a question sort of we have some narrower houses two older 14 foot wide ledge woods they're they're pretty with roll up sides they're pretty short you know they're like eight feet or something to the ridge pole on the inside um but we do use them in the winter some and we use them in the summer and have been thinking is there a way for us to do some easy kind of ridge venting things and wondered if people use those wax openers you know and frame in like a three or four foot square thing in the middle of the house where you know you don't maybe we maybe we don't need a ton of ventilation because we do have roll-ups but just to help with help with some of that or help in the winter when those roll-ups are snowed in because we don't have power at that site so i know um dave, dave marchant has done that in one of his houses um he went kind of, if i'm remembering correctly it's been a, been a little while he went every other bay <clears throat> with a wax cylinder window and just you know framed in some wiggle wire on either side to to do that um my recollection is he he wasn't totally thrilled with the result it didn't quite it didn't quite do what he was hoping for so i think there you know it my sense is it comes down to how much open area you end up with when they're open um and so maybe every other bay isn't super helpful but every bay would be and then you kind of got to ask yourself why do that versus a retrofit Ridge fan. But it'd be worth talking with Dave and see what what's the what his latest feelings are on that. Can I chime in on that real quick? Yeah. We've only installed that in one house. I think they I think the they make a polycarbonate pre-framed vent, uh kind of like a skylight basically that wiggle wires into the poly itself. Um, and then we include those unit, we add those univent wax cylinder openers um they were they're kind of cool um i don't know how, i couldn't speak to how much ventilation they actually offered they were on a small house uh kind of like andy was talking about but they do catch a lot of snow the way they were built and so we didn't really like them because i don't know the actual experience because i haven't talked to the guys since we installed them but they do they catch snow and ice and we didn't think that was very good much like my skylights on my house do um, and on a house, we didn't feel like on a poly house, we didn't feel like that was the best option. A ridge vent, you won't have that option. You won't have that problem. Excuse me. So is that is that even when closed because they have some structure that goes above? Yeah, there was. They don't they don't close flush with the rest of the poly. So there's some protrusion above the poly, um, and we like to avoid that wherever possible um, because that creates once there's a little bit of snow up there, then there's some melt because the house is warm. Then you get an ice build up there. That ice build up is going to be considerably heavy. Um, and if you yeah. have, as you were saying, one every other one, I think we did like five across a 96 foot house. Um, if you do one every other day, that's going to be quite a few of those. Um, so you'd have to be pretty on top of clearing the snow and ice. If you do that, like, you know, you should be, maybe you're okay. And if on a smaller house, you can kind of reach up to that. Um, but alternatively, I've worked with a lot of growers who have small houses that are only about eight feet tall and it's difficult to get end wall venting above doors if you're building six or seven foot doors um, you don't have a lot of options above your door to get a, a a gable end peak vent in some ventilations on either side of the doors you can get fans are the best way to ventilate a long house like that 
um, because you really have to push air, keep the side, the end walls clear of snow. Um, but if you do have the option to add a ridge vent to it, that's probably the easiest way. Thanks, Mike. And uh, Gregory has noted that they, they've been using wax cylinder vents uh, for five years now. They're happy with them. Um, and uh, he's noting they're limited to a 30 inch vent max. They, they have, they're rated by how much weight they can move. Um, and um, I think there's some, some things that can be done uh, with that, with a lever arm, but. Um, I'll add one more thing if I could. The, we, we actually install a lot of those on houses that don't have power on end wall vents. So the aluminum louvered vents, 30 inches is the max. You know, we'll install four of those on a single house. We just did this twice in the last couple of weeks. Um, and they're passively open when it's warm. So it's, it's, a, it's all about the passive ventilation. Some hot air is obviously getting out. They work really nicely though, and they're not that expensive. Yeah, a question came up during uh, New England Fruit and Veg about the cold temp, those wax cylinders in uh, winter temperatures. Um, some people had heard that they they have a, a min temperature rating or that they they have frozen. I, I had not heard of that or run into it or seen it, and I've certainly had some um, used throughout the winter. Did anybody run into problems? I'll I'll reach out to the manufacturer and see what the what that the deal is on that rating. I think it it may be an operational rating, not a failure rating. I I don't know. Um, and then Ben has a question: Is it better to have? Um, thanks, Mike is saying ha hasn't seen wax cylinders freeze uh, himself. Uh, ben was asking: Is it better to have fans up high or down on the lower part of the end wall? My my feeling is up high. The the reason we have vents is to exhaust warmer more humid air that's going to tend to be up high so having the fans up high um, allow for that there are other reasons that you may not be able to do that um, you know for one thing you may not have the end wall real estate to have two fans up high um, but that's my sense i'd love to hear what other people's perspective it, perspectives are on that location of end wall fans i think if you plan to use them in the winter as well you'll you'll want them clear of snow, of course. So Susan offers that wax, their wax cylinders have needed to be recalibrated or replaced after winter time. And Mike is adding that they like to install fans up high on one end and vents lower down on the other end to pull essentially cooler air in, not much cooler, but maybe a little. I guess just on that note, I've always wondered about like, you know, you get these like March days where it's cold outside, but sunny and you have that vent open and that really cold air comes in and blasts those plants like right in the front. So just like the placement of how we um, are managing things in our climate, I think is, can be tricky. And I often forget that and then set things up and then like that thing opens and you're like, oh no, those poor baby little things I just transplanted are getting nailed by zero degree air coming in. So thinking that through. What else? How, how's the winter been for disease? Um, the cutworms ate everything on my farm. So <laughs> just kidding. But I, I don't know. I wonder how it's been for other folks. We, I, I feel like I've heard from growers less, um, less downy mildew incidents this year, unless Claudus Borum, but I don't know if that's a reality or just less chitter chatter about it. I guess like on another note too, Chris, I've been wondering um, on the other end of the spectrum, like heat management and heat stresses that we've had the last couple of summers and tunnels and um, how ventilation can help support our like really getting that super hot air out and um, also like where shade cloth plays into this because mm. um, I think that's been a big concern is pollination issues and blossom drop and heat related stresses on plants and how we can actually manage for that. Yeah, it's it's something I'd, I'd really like to dig into more um, in particular sort of um, temperature at different 
different places in the house. And I'd really like to do some 3D temperature mapping um, of how you know tunnels and houses manage differently and with different crops. And one of my concerns is if we de if we're depending on roll-up sides and doors and end wall ventilation for say um, heavy you know high density canopy crops to tomatoes and uh, cucumbers for example how well are we ventilating the very top of of that and um you know i i i don't know i mean if anybody has observations to offer whether you're seeing some of those signs of stress um at different places along the the height of the crop that would be that'd be helpful to know um the, I will say that the number of calls I get about ventilation in the middle of summer have increased um, definitely over the past few years. Um, so um, more ventilation, I think shade cloth is, an, is another um, um, important practice for us to, to talk about. And I'm, I'm not sure what people are using um, in terms of the percent transmittance. The other, um, the other thing I've seen is, um, some people do is, is throw um, uh, pale and clay mixture um, on, on plastic as well for sort of short-term shade that was gonna, that's going to rinse off in the next rainstorm. Um, you know, doing that versus shade cloth. I mean, what, what's been your, what have you seen for shade cloth use, Becky? Um, I've heard in red 30% is kind of what we want to aim for. I do, um, I do work with like a grower who used 60% and put it on pretty early and had really elongated stems and pretty poor fruit sets. So you can go too high, you know, we're still, the plants still need the photosynthetic activity. And so I think 30% is a kind of the target recommendation I've read. And then, like you're mentioning, there are these products like Cool Ray is the trade name, I think, for one of the paint ons or a lime yeah. mixture um, for the short term um, light blocking. But I, I'm leaning towards shade cloth, I think, just as a like a, a kind of proactive way to manage the summer heat stress. And Ben's asking, would older plastic let less light for summer growing? I, I think it you you, do, you don't want to go that way because you're just really blocking out the photosynthetically active radiation, which is what you want. I think the, the plastics have, Chris probably can nerd out better than I can, but they have filters that bring in the type of light that you want for your plants to have. And they're filtering. And as those break down over time, you're getting less of the radiation that you want for your plants. So I don't think it's a benefit to let the plastic age, but maybe Mike or Chris, you guys know more about the newer plastics. Um, I'm wondering if Ben was just talking about almost using like some old plastic kicking around at, at in place of a shade cloth. I don't know. Oh. Okay. Um, and I would have to do some more nerding on that to really differentiate shade cloth from old plastic. And Andy's asking the timing of inst installation and removal of shade cloth would make a big difference. Um, yeah, I think that's totally right. And we have this like, you know, huge bell curve in Vermont of our day lengths really um, peaking out at the sol summer solstice. So, um, and obviously it depends on what what crops were growing in the tunnels, but I, I was thinking more strategically of using the shade cloth primarily during these times of intense heat and um, trying to prevent that stress in that way um, and making them somewhat easily removable so that as, you know, we have these fluctuations, maybe they're only on for like a week at a time or something. But yeah, I probably wouldn't... Um, wouldn't use them at a time when we have these shorter days and you really want the maximum photosynthesis. Uh, Alex says, is there any merit or scenarios to push air in rather than exhaust? I've seen it help with being able to open doors in winter, warmish air melts away snow at the door threshold. Chris. Yeah, um, that certainly sounds like a benefit. Um, I haven't seen that myself, but I can imagine it. Um, the other thing with um, with pulling air in, you when it's 
um, negative horizontal ventilation, you tend to be able to control where the air comes in a little bit better um, using louvers and, and roll up sides and other things. Um, it may not seem intuitive, but when you're pushing air in, you don't actually get the distribution of pressure drop as well as you do when you're when you create suction. So that's, I think, by and large, one of the main reasons uh, for doing that. Great. Well, um, Chris, I, maybe do you want to post the link to your ag, um, your awesome resource, ag engineering? Um, tons and tons of good links and resources on that. Chris and Andy do an amazing job keeping that updated and providing us with all the great information we need to be better farmers. And thank you to Tom for your great information on NRCS programs and the links in there. Um, and Mike and John and everybody else for helping inform the conversation. And um, it looks like one more question from Gregory uh, asking, what do folks do in summer when maximum ventilation is needed, but a sudden big windstorm? I, <laughs> we got to close out, Gregory. That's too hard of a question. No, but so when, when we have these big windstorm events, do you open or close when it's hot out? And hopefully you don't lose power. Any thoughts on that? Chris, what do you recommend? Um. Depends how big, right? <laughs> um, big, big, big enough so that any opening in the house is going to lead to damage. I think you got to close up, and you know, um, I know Vern has a good compilation of all the creative ways people have dealt with severe weather events. Um, I don't have that link handy, but it's it's on the the uh, Veg and Berry uh, website. Um, you know, bringing bring vehicles in um, on the the, um, the lee side of the building and things like that. So um, yeah, I, I, my sense is it's probably a gut feel thing. How, how bad how bad is the wind gonna be? Um, and I'm not sure, I'm sure everybody has a different answer for that. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm agreeing with Mike here too on closing up and I, I remember um, Skip Paul has posted a lot of good resources from Rhode Island. They have a lot more storms and before Irene, there was a lot of good advice, but I think the, if there's no entry point for air to come in and like yank on the tunnel, the better off you are. So yeah, John's agreeing with Mike. So sorry, Gregory, your flowers might cook if there's a big storm, but. I did find Vern's list. And oh, great. Thanks, Chris. And Mike's saying most of the tunnels he's seen have been mangled by wind have been opened. I guess another question I have is um, best to run out and cut the plastic in that case if it's starting to get mangled or is it too late? Maybe you don't want to be out there in that biggest storm actually <laughs> with a knife in your hand. <laughs> I could I can just answer that I've seen folks that do that and ultimately if it's really that far gone it may save your structure if it's really going um, but again the ones that really have been mangled by wind it's usually not from a sustained wind storm um, it's usually from some microburst we've seen in the past couple of years and that happens fast so you're not going to really even have time uh, we're going to be rebuilding a Rimmel house at American Flatbread in Waitsfield this spring that had a microburst come in in like less than a minute. It took took the house and turned it inside out and took off two um, solar tracker solar panels right next to them. Um, had they gotten out and cut the poly off, maybe. Um, the problem with that house actually was that it was closed up. It had old single pane windows that were really attractive built into the end walls. Um, I did not install those. They had another guy do them. They got blown out by that wind. That wind got in the house and then turned that house inside out. Um, had they been able to cut that poly off, yeah, they probably would have saved the structure itself because you get this inverse thing where there's pressure inside pushing against the house and then pressure outside pulling against the house at the same time and it bends um, everything up. So I have heard of people running out and cutting poly. They do that when they have ice that's about to take down a house too to try to save it like that. So you're better to lose a couple hundred dollars worth of poly than to lose the whole house um, if you're in that kind of a situation. 
Thank you, Mike. Yeah. But, um, I, I see a new webinar on like high tunnel disaster photos. Or, or mitigations. Yeah. yeah. Times when, both times when it didn't work out and times when it did work out. That'd be great. Well, thank you everybody so much for sharing. John says building a Rimmel to replace a non Rimmel that had wind damage. So the project that Mike just referred to, I think, is it, it's a Rimmel going in place of a non Rimmel. Ah. If I have that right. Gotcha. Thanks, John. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, I can um, post the chat since it has so many good links when we um, when we post the recording on the VVBGA, uh, um, the, sorry, the Veg and Berry Port website. So thank you guys, everybody, and happy growing, happy skiing, this thanks, last one versus snow, and take care. Thanks, Becky.